Hi there guys, it's Mike from MCQ Bushcraft here and welcome to another episode of Bushcraft Basics. In last week's episode we had a look at fatwood, a resource that can be gathered from coniferous trees, from the stumps, branches and even the roots of the tree when they've rotted out or died on the ground. But in this week's episode we're actually going to have a look at fire feathers. And if you're not familiar with a fire feather, it's where you split wood down and you make fine shavings into curls, actually feather the wood out and increase the surface area to make it usable to actually ignite much easier. And if you feather well, it can really be the difference between not having a fire and having a fire in environments where resources are sparse. So let's have a look at my immediate area around me. We're going to have a look at the types of woods that are on the ground and pick something that's perfect for making a feather. So we have a dead tree in front of us here and this is what's referred to as dead standing wood and you may hear that term used a lot it's definitely a term you'll hear used in wet weather fire lighting always look for, for um, dead standing wood and that just means wood that's dead that's standing and that's essentially what this is this piece here is dead standing wood the piece next to me there or even this piece this is dead standing and it just means it's off the ground when wood's on the ground you don't generally want to use it if it's saturated because it'll just have moss all over it or plant life and it'll absorb a lot of moisture and unless you're looking to steam some food or produce a very smoky fire you don't generally want to use it but if you're going to make a fire feather it's usually for one of two reasons the first reason could be that you have some tinder like birch bark or fatwood and you want to take that flame from the birch bark and fatwood and make it bigger very quickly because you can't find dry twigs or dead standing wood very easily so you make a feather and the feathers then put over that flame and it makes it very bigger very quickly and you can assist that with lots and lots of feathers and have a roaring fire in a very short space of time that's hot enough to ignite other wood around it that might be slightly damp if you're struggling in colder or wet conditions. The reason I often make feathers is because I'm in an environment where I can't find reliable tinders they will easily accept a spark from my ferro rod. So I find wood that's off the ground, I feather it, create a lot of surface area, make very thin fine shavings of the feather, put a spark in it from the ferro rod and I've got a flame right there and then and it can only be built upon quite easily. But knowing a bit about your environment also can greatly assist you in making feathers. For example this wood here, this tree that's come down, this is an oak, an English oak and it's very easy to tell that has a very linear grain structure, the way it rots is quite uniform, it always looks very similar and the branches are very angular and it looks to me, oak always reminds me of this, a very large antler that's fallen on the forest floor and if you remember that then it can be very easy to identify but oak wouldn't be my first choice to make a feather with this is something I would come back to almost definitely when my fire is going I would come back to this oak, put it on my fire and it would give me an incredibly hot bed of embers and burn for me almost all night, keep me warm, help me cook my food. It'd be an easy fire to manage. So this is something we would come back to much later and we can talk about that much later on in the series when we get to that stage. But in this environment here, it being a coniferous environment, I've got much better options. I've got conifers dead standing all over the place that contain resin and would make a very volatile feather. So let's go have a look around and see what we can find. This bit here looks pretty good, it's off the floor so moisture won't have gotten to it and rotted it down too quickly. It's a bit of conifer, this is actually spruce, there's a lot of Norwegian spruce in this area and this is just one that's come down, in fact there's lots of them all around me here that have come down and you can tell it's dead wood as well, if you break some of the branches, have a look at the bark that's actually peeling off, you get a good indication that it's actually been dead for some time, we've even got a nice bit of fat wood just in that actual shoulder there that I've picked off so again it has more resources to offer than just the feather as we looked at last week but the piece you really need to pick is the smoothest and straightest piece and you really want as few branches coming out of it as possible you want a nice straight grain to work with with very few kind of curls in the grain where branches would have been coming out and uh, that will mean you can feather it very very easily so I'm going to take a piece that's about a foot long and then we can split it down and start working with it take the excess off first, so the weight of the branch to my left here 
and drop away. And that way you're not then working with something on the floor and you can stand up. But that's nice and dry in there. It looks very good. Here we go. The piece of wood I've chosen is quite thick. There's a good reason for that. I generally don't go for very thin pieces of wood when I'm feathering because I live in a damp climate and thin wood absorbs moisture far easier than thick wood. With this particular piece of wood here, you'll find the core is very, very dry. Even then the outside might have a bit of moisture in it and would have rotted slightly, and that's where the moisture will be held. The centre is always dry, so when you actually split this down and work with the inside, you're working with dry wood. So that's really where the logic of that comes from. We're gonna batten this down as well. This is only a foot long and it's quite thick and straight. Pretty easy to work with. You just place your knife on top and start battening. We did talk about knife safety, so do be aware of this triangle here, of the inner leg. You can even put your side to it if you wish to, if you're a bit uncomfortable. But just make sure you're not straddling it when you're battening it, because things can go wrong, you can lose control. You're out in the woods on your own with a wound to the inner leg, then it's, um, it's lights out really, if it's a bad one. We'll just... Uh, Start splitting that down, that was a pretty solid bit of wood. There we are. Feathering's pretty simple. I always place a little piece of wood that I might have spare on the ground, just like that. And then what you find is you have quite a hard surface that you can put pressure down on. And if you look at my position, I'm sideways to the piece of wood and it's as low as possible. The higher up it is, the more bend you have in your arm and the trickier the technique becomes. All you really need to do is start quite far up. We do have a knot there. It's not really too much of an issue. And just start running your knife very lightly down the corner. You can obviously dig in a bit towards the bottom as well. And the more pressure you apply, the more of a curl you end up with, the thicker the curl. You can see that one thing I always quite like to do is I always like to work on these ridges. You end up with little ridges everywhere when you're working on a piece of wood. And when you feather on a ridge, you generally get a much better result than if you try and feather on a great big flat piece. And obviously the harder you push, the thicker the feather will be. The lighter you push, the more consistent your stroke, the thinner and fluffier the feather will actually be. So you can alter that. But really when you're starting to get to the end of the feather where you're going to be using your ferro rod at this particular part here, which is generally what you would do, you make much finer feathers. You can angle the feather as well. For example, if I point my knife like this, you'll see that the curl starts to face a particular way and actually spiral like that. Whereas if I just go down flat, then the curl just bunches up into a little barrel. And if you go the other way like this, you can actually send the curl in the opposite direction. You'll find different woods perform differently when producing feathers. This is actually a particularly good wood in terms of its resin content, Norwegian spruce, but in terms of feathering, there are other woods that I prefer and they actually produce much better feathers. Goat willow is one of the most common woods that we find in this woodland here when you start getting into deciduous and it produces a really, really beautiful feather and burns very well, even though it doesn't have a resin content like the conifer here, it still burns fantastically and um, it doesn't rot down too quickly if off the ground. Another one I like is hazel. Lots of hazel here, very straight grain, really easy to work with. The only trouble you'll find with it is it rots incredibly quickly. So finding one that's quite hard in the core and dry can just be a little bit tricky at times, but it's everywhere. So you generally have quite a range to pick from if you are wandering through a part of the woodland with a lot of hazel in. It's got an incredibly straight grain which is why it splits so well. And you can then always work off of that peak that you end up with. 
and being quite a soft wood as well it's quite easy to work with you can kind of be as hard and soft on it as you like and produce really nice long wispy feathers or we'll work on a flat area produce thicker ones you can even angle it produce sort of angled feathers as well that start to curl like we did on the spruce but you can just see the difference in the way this is feathering to this wood here which was actually harder to work with but in a way it gives you better results simply because of the resin content but that doesn't mean you can't experiment with other woods and it doesn't mean that you just have to look for conifer so once you've made your feathers you can take your ferro rod and actually try and light one and once you've lit one and it's burning well the others go on top and you've got a roaring fire when I'm making feathers I always work on the ground, even if the ground's damp, I don't mind the outer of this here getting wet and hopefully I'd position myself somewhere where I'm out of heavy rain before I even begin doing this kind of work, get a tarp up or a shelter of some description. But the reason the ground's good is it's a stable surface and when you put pressure down on the feather it will bed itself into the soft ground and it won't move around. If you're working, for example, on a small log or stump, things can wobble everywhere and it gets pretty irritating. But we're going to put the ferrocerium rod just here, where the softest material is, and you can even get your knife and just create a small divot for the end of the ferro rod to go into. And this is really the key, you just want to take your time with this sort of thing. And when you press down now with the ferro rod, you're actually pushing down the feather and what you can do now is just put some sparks in, find your feet with it. You see we had a little flame straight away. And then eventually you'll get a flame and you hold the feather like that. Because obviously heat rises vertically and you want that heat to transfer into the other material and start burning it. We might have got lucky with this. Oh, well, yep, it is burning. I thought it was just smoking after that. And it starts to burn. And you can see you get a lot of flame off of that, a lot of heat. It's a really good technique to use. So just to show you it's not all about the conifers, we have the hazel here as well. Same process. I'm just flatten an area. For the fair rod sometimes you can put your knee on it like I can do with this and just stabilize it a little bit you've got those really fine curls there oh almost there we go and they should ignite a little bit easier than the rest and if you hold that vertically it transfers upward into the rest of the material you can see that hazel's lovely, makes a good feather. But notice about different thicknesses of curls, you see the thicker curls burn for much longer than the thinner curls that disappear very rapidly. So always stagger your curls, make thick ones and thin ones, and they can both assist each other and assist you to ignite that, those twigs and things that might be actually a bit damp and need that assistance. Another scenario might be like we talked about, you want to use the feather with an existing tinder like fatwood. This is the fatwood we gathered on last week's episode and it should perform even better now that it's been sitting at home and drying out. We just need to scrape this down. And you can see I've cleaved some of the hazel to make a flat surface. I always do that. Flat surfaces are highly underrated especially when you're outside. Take a section of that off, try not to splay it everywhere. Fair rod on top again. This should be much easier. There we go. Some flame. We can transfer that into the feather. 
We didn't even use much material there. We could have used a lot more in, in the real world if we wanted to make a fire. But you can see that was easy street. You really didn't need too much effort there. With something like fat wood, you know, you're really laughing if you make a feather. So I hope this video helped out. Really just a simple video covering fire feathers. And it's a subject that you may not use too often. You may find that you don't need to use fire feathers, but just remember it's always useful to have that skill because as we've just demonstrated, you can create a fire with just wood alone. It doesn't even need to be particularly thin, twiggy pieces of wood. You can choose a very big log, split it down and make a feather with the dry wood inside. And in some environments, when it's been raining for months on end, that wood will be soaked and you'll need to seek out those thicker dead logs to actually split them down to get to the dry wood and feather it. And it could be the difference between having a fire and not having a fire. But what I would advise to you at this point in the training series is to actually go out and start identifying different trees. Get yourself a useful tree ID book. If you have a look at the description of this video, I've put a few in there for you in the British Isles. Um, unfortunately for you guys overseas, you might have to seek experts in your region to actually tell you which books to have a look at, but it's a great thing to be able to do. And don't just ID wood, take a section of it home, carve with it, work with it, burn it, and see how it performs. Burning wood and carving with it really tells you a great story about that piece of wood in your mind's eye. And when you look at a tree, you don't just have a look at the tree itself and take it for face value, you look beyond the bark, you see the timber, and you start to imagine what that wood is good for and remember the experiences you've had with it. So I hope this video's helped out and thanks again for watching. And I will see you very soon in another episode of Bushcraft Basics. Thanks again, guys. Take care.